the 55th annual ISNA convention. In God we trust. I'm Altaf Hussein. You may know me in this convention in my capacity as the vice president of ISNA, but alhamdulillah, I'm uh, very honored uh, also to be called to serve as the vice president of the Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research, whose president, inshallah, I'll introduce in a second. So while you're here for this session, we also throughout the weekend have introduced the college students to other programs Yaqeen is doing, as well as inshallah, uh, online. We have an app as well. So we hope inshallah that you will download the app and you'll get to know Yaqeen as well. But for now, because we're short on time, I, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce our, the founder and the president of the Yaqeen Institute, Sheikh Omar Suleiman. And he brought his own mic. I brought <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam wa rasulillah wa alihi wa sahbihi wa nawala. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Altaf. And to all of you for, for being committed enough to come uh, this early in the morning, alhamdulillah, I know that conventions can be particularly exhausting. Uh, you get divided between many sessions and you're jumping from place to place. But alhamdulillah, uh, confident Muslim over the last couple of years has become a feature of many of the national Islamic conventions. And interestingly enough, though it, it ends up on a, a morning, a Saturday or a Sunday morning, uh, you find people that will uh, get out of bed just to be here at Confident Muslim, alhamdulillah rabbil ameen. So jazakumullah khayran to all of you for coming. This was a program that we started out of the belief that contribution is a direct fruit of conviction. When Allah talks about the tree of faith in the Qur'an and Allah mentions the roots of that tree and the foundation Asluha thabit wa far'uha fis sama and its branches are high in the sky providing fruit and shade for everyone around. It's out of that direct belief that if a person truly understands what their faith calls them to then they will better understand their responsibility to humanity as a whole and they will never feel like they have to relinquish any part of their Islamic identity in order to benefit uh, people all around them. Alhamdulillah, this year in this convention, we're very honored to have uh, Sister Tahira Rahman. Now, Sister Tahira is someone that uh, many of us only heard about after she achieved the great milestone of becoming the first uh, newscaster in hijab in Chicago at a local news station and many of us were very touched by her story. And SubhanAllah, I think the most profound thing about Tahira's story is that she didn't set out to become the first hijabi newscaster on news television. Instead, she worked hard and she refused behind the scenes as she fought with the support of her family and obviously leaning on her faith to maintain her Dean to maintain her obligations while she rose in the ranks through her hard work ethic, alhamdulillah, and leaned on her faith. So we heard about the end result, but we didn't get much about the journey leading up to that, especially from a faith perspective. I was incredibly inspired by her that day, and right away I started reaching out to uh, those, of, uh, those of our uh, staff and volunteers and fellows that live in Chicago and said, you know, what, it, what do you think? Can we, can we get Tahira to come to our next Confident Muslim session? Alhamdulillah, I mean, she graciously uh, accepted. And she's used to interviewing people, but today I have the, uh, the honor of interviewing her, inshallah ta'ala. But before that, I'd like to bring her on and I'd like to read a short bio. And then inshallah ta'ala, we'll play a short video um, and, uh, and she'll join us. Tahira, uh, Tahira Rahman is a... TV news reporter at WHBF TV, a CBS affiliate in the Quad Cities. She's the first full time broadcast TV reporter in the United States to wear a hijab. Prior to this position, she was a producer for the same station creating the evening broadcasts. Tahira started her career as a producer of Radio Islam, the nation's first daily live talk show produced by Muslims for the mainstream market. During her tenure, Tahira led the organization to a 200% growth. Tahira also worked with Al Jazeera English in Doha, Qatar and CBS Evening News Chicago Bureau. She graduated from Loyola University, Chicago, 
magna cum laude in journalism and international studies, where she was the first editor-in-chief of the Loyola Phoenix, the university's award-winning weekly newspaper. Inshallah ta'ala will play a short video and then please welcome Sister Tahir al-Rahman. Story that's all too familiar for Tahira's friend, mentor, and mom of two girls, Miriam Sobe. I've been working in Chicago for 13 years covering stories for radio uh, networks and I've tried all throughout these years, even uh, up until like a couple months ago, to apply for jobs, to meet with news directors here in the city, and it always comes down to the headscarf. Miriam's journey started in the late 90s and while she's faced plenty of rejection, she's continued to push the boundaries of American journalism and pave the way. It took years and a lot of no's for Tahir Rahman to get to this moment, but while she's just minutes away from making history, it's important to know what it took to get here. I didn't kind of have anyone who looked like me that was on TV, so I never really thought it was a possibility. However, all that changed after a few internships. That's when Tahira figured out TV news was her real passion, and that's also when reality set in. I interned with the CBS Evening News Bureau in Chicago, and my producers there, everyone just said it was going to be hard. One of my producers even asked me point blank, he's like, if you got a dream, your dream offer, let's say, at like CNN, they're going to give you a reporting gig, but they wanted you to take off your headscarf, would you do it? And I said, no, like, you know, and then he's like, well, then get ready for a lot of no's. But after so much rejection, it's only human to break down. And that was the day she called her mom in the car, a call that quite possibly changed her life. I had to pull over because I couldn't stop crying. Um, and I was like, I can't do it anymore. And she said, yes, you can. And she was like, She's like, you can and you will. You get back up every time and you're going to get back up this time. And the next time an opportunity becomes available, you're going to go for it again and you're going to keep going for it. And that's what I did. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much for waking up with me today. Um, we first start in the name of God, as always. In alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu wa nastaghfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina man yahdillahu fala mudillalah wa man yudlil fala hadiyalah wa ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu la sharika lah. Nebraska 2016. That was me second phone interview for a TV reporting job that I had been interviewing for and looking for for months. I was this close to getting it and I could feel it. I aced the interview. I had a really good back and forth with the news director, but that dreaded phone call came. The one that said, we're sorry, but we decided to go a different direction. I'd heard that before, but it doesn't get any easier. And at that moment, I realized that there were two paths in front of me. One, take off my hijab. Get rid of the biggest red mark on my resume. The one that seemed to make employers feel more than comfortable with putting my skills to use behind the camera, but for some reason, not in front of it. The other path was to stay on the one that I was on, was to keep my hijab, to work harder, possibly twice, three times, four times as long to get to where I want to go, but inshallah stay in the favor of the one whose favor I'd ultimately need in order to succeed. So I don't think it's a surprise which path I ended up going on, I decided to take a behind the scenes job as a producer at WHTBF TV, which is a CBS affiliate in the Quad Cities. And I thought, you know what, this will be good experience. I got there, and when I got there, I realized, wow, this moment may never come here in the Quad Cities. This little corner of Iowa doesn't 
see Muslims very often, let alone hijabis. I'm talking straight cornfields and country music. And so, alhamdulillah, I thought, you know what? At the very least, this will be a stepping stone for me. Even when one of my coworkers, when I disclosed my dream, said, you know what, I don't think America will ever be ready, be ready for a hijabi TV reporter. But I went to work, and fast forward about nine months into that job, a TV reporting position opened up at my station. I was really excited. I went for it, I applied for it, didn't get it. I thought again, do I keep going or do I give up on something that seems impossible? I kept going. I worked harder. I worked every night, longer hours than I needed to. I came in whenever they needed someone. I came in on weekends to perfect my craft because I thought, you know what, maybe, just maybe, it wasn't my hijab. Maybe I'm just not good enough and I need to get there. I didn't want to leave any stone unturned. So, fast forward to March of 2017. At this point, I had been at the station for about a year. And a few positions opened up to report on TV. And I thought, I mean, talk about confident Muslim, that was me. March 2017, I was like, I was here for a year, I had a good reputation, alhamdulillah, with everybody, not only in my newsroom, but who worked at the station. Everybody knew my dream at this point. Everybody knew my goals. And they had seen my improvements and how hard I was working. So I applied. And I didn't get it. I was devastated, to say the least. I mean, you saw in that video, I think now, pretty much the entire world has seen me cry. That was the moment. <laughs> that was the moment where I had to pull over and talk to my mom because I thought, I have been working nonstop for the past year. If not now, then when? What else can I do? I don't know what else to do to get this job. And so of course, Mama Rahman, who you heard, um, a little bit about her influence there, but she wouldn't let me rest, and she said, you're gonna keep trying. And so I did, I went back to work. And fast forward to fall of the same year, September 2017. Another position opened up. And as you can imagine, at this point, I was still traumatized by my last experience. I didn't even want to apply. I didn't want to go through it again. I didn't know if I could handle it. But I did. I was encouraged by actually some of my coworkers even to apply. And then I waited, and I waited, and I waited. And finally one day when I came into work that afternoon, I was called into the general manager's office. And he closed the door and he said, Tahira, you've earned this job. You got the job. Alhamdulillah. And I found out that the anchors of our newscast had each gone in separately to talk on my behalf. They each went in and said, how hard I'd been working, how capable, more than capable I was of the job, and they each told my boss that he'd be making the wrong decision if he didn't hire me. SubhanAllah, I had no idea that this was going on. And so finally, on February 8th, 2018, I became the first Muslim woman to wear hijab while reporting on an American TV news station. Alhamdulillah. So that's it, right? I persevered, I stuck to my principles, 
The lights dim, the cameras fade to black, we all ride off into the sunset, America is a better place. Not exactly. One thing I've learned since then is that perseverance doesn't stop once you've attained your goals. Actually, perhaps now more so than ever, you need to draw strength from your faith. I get up probably around nine every day. My shift doesn't start till 1.30 in the afternoon, but we're required to come in with a story already vetted, a lead story worthy. And so I'm making those calls. I'm going in because now that I've got the job, now that I've earned my job, you have to keep it. All of this means nothing if you're not worthy of the job and you're not perfecting your craft. So I go in every day and then just like all my other fellow reporters, we're there in the field Rain, shine, below freezing. Um, just this past week, there were strong winds, 70 mile an hour winds, but I was out there with tree branches falling in my face and my hood over my hijab just dripping everywhere. And to boot, we carry our own gear. Most of the time, I don't have a photographer. I'm carrying my tripod, my lights, my microphones, and trying to track people down who, believe it or not, people don't like to talk on camera. So Ramadan was especially tough this year, I'll just say that. But alhamdulillah, there are things that get me through it. What gets me through it is a handwritten card from an 82-year-old woman with a $2 bill attached. And she says that she switched channels just to watch me when she found out, and the $2 bill was for good luck. Messages like the one from a Scotland Yard detective in London, who subhanAllah said that he cried when he saw my story. And he wanted me to meet his daughter because he wants her to know that she can be whatever she wants to be when she grows up. Messages from people like Frank, a teacher in Pennsylvania, who sent me a video and a picture on Twitter of his class learning about me for Women's History Month. Messages like the one from Dave, who calls himself in a message an average white man who grew up in, on a farm in central Iowa. And he told me, you represent the Iowa that I want to live in. Thank you for doing what you're doing. And then he invited me to dinner with him and his wife. Messages like the phone calls that I still get, actually, weeks after I interviewed a veteran in the Quad Cities about how he was on the verge of becoming homeless. And he still calls me and he tells me that the best part about me sharing his story has been the kind person that he met through it. And the job in Nebraska that I didn't get, that news director actually messaged me after my story started circulating. She told me that she still feels, quote, awful about having to reject me. She says, you were one of the best interviews, you had a great reel, but that decision came from men in suits high, higher above me. I had no part in that decision, and now that I don't work for that station anymore, I have no problem telling you that. But it's also not always all rainbows and butterflies. There are some difficult moments, things that get me down. And you'd think that it would actually be the racist remarks. But those are actually few and far between, subhanAllah. And whenever they do come up, my Quad Cities community is quick to jump to my defense even before I have a chance to do so myself. But what gets me down is actually the criticism from our own community. She's wearing makeup. Her clothes are too tight. She, this isn't Islam. She's not a Muslim. That's what gets me down. 
And it's not new. I'm sure that every single woman in here, whether you're hijabi or not, has faced the exact same kind of criticism. And you can substitute my struggle with hijab with anything else, habaya, niqab. For men, whether you have a beard or not, that's what gets me down. But then, once again, we all find ourselves now facing two paths. One, you can say, well, fine, if I'm going to be criticized either way, whether I'm trying or not, whether I'm struggling to be the best or not, I might as well take the easy route out. I might as well just do what I want to do if I'm going to be criticized anyway. And that's the route that a lot of people take. We've seen that. We are seeing that play out in the hallways of our schools and our universities and even our workplaces. But then there's always that other path. There's a path that you struggle on, but you acknowledge it and you say, yes, I do need to work on myself. I, just like every other human being on this planet, have to perfect myself. But that struggle is between me and Allah. And inshallah, with his help, I can get better day by day. We learn from the cradle to the grave as Muslims. And if you stop learning along the way and if you stop growing, that's when you need to reevaluate yourself. That's when you are probably doing it wrong. So my message tonight, or not tonight, today, this morning, to you is not a lecture, but it's encouragement for you as well as myself to not be discouraged by that path, to stay on it. Even if you feel weighted and led and every single step you take seems hard and slow, know that that struggle is not scary. It's a good sign. You should own it, work with it. Because ahead of you, is always Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that path is always the path worth taking. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Zakmullah khairan, thank you for those inspirational words. Um, I know you're used to doing the interviewing, so it must be different to be on the other side. And I'm used to getting interviewed, so this is, <laughs> I always enjoy doing this part too because I, uh, I get to ask the questions that I typically would, would appreciate being asked and I think are uh, meaning, meaningful. Uh, first of all, um, I do want to recognize uh, your mother, mashallah, Sister Durdana. Um, can you stand up, inshallah, Ta'ala? Oh, she's my, over there. My dad's here too now. Um, I feel like I should also be interviewing you, inshallah, but may Allah bless you and reward you for instilling, uh, for doing your part to instill that type of principle and faith um, in your children. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and your entire family. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of effort, and as I was listening to you speaking, I was just thinking about the types of messages you must have been getting from your mother throughout all of these years to be able to deal with this type of pressure. Um, what I really appreciated about what you just walked us through is that it wasn't just about your career pursuit, it was about the very real continuing struggle. And I think as Muslims, we often um, you know, become complacent with ourselves. And I've spoken about this quite a bit at the convention that you reach a point and then you say, well, I've done exactly what I want to do. And you tend to look down upon those that are quote unquote less than you, not realizing that everyone has their unique struggles and everyone has their unique, uh, their unique pursuits of good. I guess my question to you would be, um, as you were going through those moments, the most difficult moments of your struggle, not to get too personal, but what was it from the Qur'an or what was it from the faith that 
Was there a particular ayah, a particular hadith, a particular story that motivated you and that inspired you to keep on going? First of all, I'd like to give a shout out to my dad. He's also here. Oh, where's he at? <laughs> no, you stand up too, mashallah. I didn't. <laughs> all right, I've got to walk this back now. <laughs> it's okay. Zakallah khair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and bless you. I didn't see you sitting there, so I didn't, re I didn't know you were here. May Allah bless you and reward you for all that you've done as well. <laughs> Zakallah khair. Um, and because of the, like you said, the environment I grew up in and the household, alhamdulillah, since a young age, my parents were always making sure, I mean, we went to Islamic schools, but even when we weren't, I mean, we heard these stories like they were bedtime stories of different prophets and their struggles and how they persevered. So not only that, but I think it was important to have real life role models who both my parents work um, and they were able to raise five kids, <laughs> mashallah, and they also stayed strong in their beliefs. They were never afraid whenever we go on road trips. Okay, we have to stop, even if it's a truck stop and we're gonna pray, or even growing up, I always felt like I was going to the movies with my friends and, oh, we need to pray. We'd find a little corner of a movie theater that wasn't being used and we prayed. So it's stuff like that that seems hard when you get older, but when you grow up with it, it actually, when, as I grew up, actually, a lot of my friends would tell me, how do you do that? And, when you, and I say, what do you mean? You have to do it. Like, and I credit that entirely to my parents. There's also an ayah that I read. I, I want to say that it really stuck out to me when I was in um, post-college, actually, and in that phase of looking for jobs. And you're the sheikh, not me, so I don't know the exact words, but um, it says, when you call on Allah, he sends a thousand angels, one after the other, to help you. And I thought, subhanAllah, like, when you pray and when you work, you don't really think about that, that there is so much power behind your call. And so that what got, that's what a lot of times got me through it was that you may think that nothing is happening, but just remember there's a lot happening that you don't know about. So I, that's what kind of kept my faith up. It's like, you know, inshallah things are happening even if I don't know it. And I appreciate what you mentioned about your parents in that regard too, because for many of us, we look for the superheroes outside of our homes. And when people ask me, um, you know, I, I'm always, when I, when I talk about my kids, I name my daughter after my, my mom, Allah Rahman. I've talked a lot about, um, you know, this idea of naming your children after the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu that it's something special. And they say, well, the name is May. I'm like, yeah, because that's my mom. And my mom was the most important influence in my life um, in terms of Dean as well as my father. And those things that they don't pay attention to often like you mentioned, just stopping and praying, no matter what the circumstance was, those are the things that really stick with you in life, and then they become part of your normal behavior, your normal ethos. So hijab is just one of those struggles, and uh, obviously it's the most prominent struggle in your case. But talk me through the job that you do and the things that you go through, and what is it that you can also speak about in terms of the growth of faith or the struggle of faith. Again, sort of an in-depth look in a type of position that you're in right now. Aside from the hijab, other than that, what's it like being a Muslim in the space that you're in in particular and trying to abide by other obligations? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, I think there, there are many. So hijab, as you said, is the most prominent and the most explicit. That's the one that everyone sees. That's your struggle that the entire world is watching you go through. Um, but there are other things like, for example, even salah and praying. Um, when I, I'm trying to meet a deadline for a live newscast and my alarms are going off, like reminding me, you have an hour, now you have 30 minutes, now you have 20 minutes, and just trying to tear yourself away and reminding myself, why am I even here? It's, it's for a reason. And, I need to go do my, that, fulfill that obligation. And so a lot of times, 
I mean, that is still a struggle with me. And one thing that always sticks with me too is my dad always says that your prayer is your most important. If you are, have so many struggles or sins that you're dealing with, make sure you never ever lose your prayer. So I always keep that in mind. Like if I don't have my prayer, what do I have? So I try to keep that prominent and first and foremost in my mind when I'm when I think that my deadline is important, well, there's something more important that's waiting for me. So a lot of times, actually, I've been on flood patrol and, and stuck in a car waiting for my live shots, and I'll, I will have to tell the photographer who's in the car with me, can you turn off the radio? I need to pray. And so just on the side of a flood in the middle of Iowa, you know, I just pray because I have to remember the importance of that and the weight of even what I have, alhamdulillah, that, that gratitude can never be shown enough, even with my salah. So um, that's, that's, I think, one of, the, one of the biggest things. And then kind of a little bit more on not a political side, but I guess a little more on the superficial side is just being the only Muslim in, on any of the TV channels in the Quad Cities. We have three stations. I'm a CBS station. We have NBC as well as ABC. And just making sure that, our, that I do represent a people. I do represent my community, and I want to make sure that that gets out there. And a lot of times, even like on Eid morning, I woke up and I was like, oh my god, I'm going to be at the Salah. Who's going to cover it? So I sent an email to everyone to make sure somebody was there because we don't have enough of those positive stories, as you know. So things like that I also try to keep in mind. So. What's the future look like, inshallah, for you? What are the, what are the things that you really hope to uh, you know, achieve, not just for yourself, but for your community, inshallah? I mean, obviously, when you're a Muslim in a public space, even if you don't intend to represent, you are forced to be a representation. And that's you know, a saying from Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, kunu du'atun lillah wa antum salamitun, be callers to Allah even as you're silent. And they said, how do you do that? He said, with your good character. More than anything else, it's going to be your akhlaq, your character that's going to rise, which will be constantly refined through the worship and praying on the side of a, a car in the middle of a flood um, and just sort of upholding that higher standard. What, what can we, inshallah, hope to see going forward? And what message do you have for others that are also striving, inshallah ta'ala, to do what you do? As far as what to... Expect from me, I honestly have no idea. What can we make du'a for? <laughs> what can we pray for you, inshallah? Inshallah that I just keep perfecting the craft. I do, I, I always make du'a that I am the best in my field and that while I do it, that I always, always, always maintain a positive light on Islam. Um, <laughs> so ultimately, that's the goal. I don't know how it will play out. SubhanAllah, I couldn't even imagine how it has played out so far. So I'm keeping an open mind, and inshallah, whatever doors open up, I'll, I'll get to assess the situation when we get there. But for right now, even every day, I'm just trying to think, what can I do today? What, how can I make an impact today? Um, and then as far as advice for people, honestly, and Sheikh, when you called me to do this, I even thought, as soon as I hung up, who am I to do this? Who am I to, to give advice people and, and tell people what to do? I mean, so many people are so much more knowledgeable than me in this audience, including my parents, um, where I get all my advice from. <laughs> but I guess the, if there's something that I've learned that I think that people could remember is that whatever it is, whatever your path is that you want to be on and your goal is, it's, it's not going to be easy. There's so many challenges, but I mean, like I even tried to portray in my talk that inshallah, if you have that faith, and even if it seem ten, seems tenuous at times, but even if you have a, a thread of faith or a thread of hope, you just have to hang on to it. And inshallah, you surround yourself with people who reinforce that, whether it be parents or other family members or even friends, because on a daily basis, 
even for me, I need that reinforcement. So don't be afraid to seek it if you don't have it. And last question, is journalism a place for young Muslim women, particularly those who want to abide by hijab? Is there a future for other Muslim girls? Do you feel like you've paved the way? And what advice would you have to those particularly trying to pursue that career? Yes, that would be amazing. The more the better. I think part of my goal is to not become, not be known as the first this or that, but like, oh yeah, she's a really great journalist who happens to be Muslim because I don't think it should be anything outstanding or unique to see a Muslim on TV or a Muslim woman who wears hijab. That should be normalized, hands down. Um, and I know there's already, Canada actually beat us to it a long time ago. Sister Janella has been on the air for quite a few years and subhanAllah, the, it's one of the great things about social media. She's been reaching out to me and giving me advice and I watch her stories and she watches mine um, in Canada. So I definitely think that it's, it's already started and several women before me have already paved the way. I can't even express how encouraging it was to be a young Muslim American hoping to be in the field of journalism where there are barely any Muslims in general, let alone Muslim women who wear hijab, but seeing like names like Noreen Hussein and Ramana Hussein in the, in the paper growing up, or Malika Bilal, who's on Al Jazeera, AJ Stream, um, international show. So things like that have offered me strength and inspiration, and I hope that I only continue that, that legacy, and inshallah, inshallah, there are many, many more women to come. And I know I said that was going to be my final question, <laughs> but I do have one more. Uh, hearing you talk about, and, and I didn't expect this, but I do think it's important, criticism that you receive within the community. What can we do to be a more supportive community? Uh, I, you know, my daughter's turning nine, mashallah. She just started oh. wearing hijab oh. by her own, um, her own decision. She, she chose to start very early and she... Uh, she's got a little bit of a defiance in her, so she's ready to take on the world as well. Uh, so I'm going to have to talk to your parents about how to do, do better in Shatlata as well, get some advice from them. But what can we do as a community, not just as a family? There's obviously the support that you got from your parents, the support from your siblings, the support from your, your immediate friends. As a community, what would you like us to do better? What do you think we can do better in Shatlata? Not just to support you as Tahira, but support other people that have dreams and that often have to balance between their own personal pursuits while being antagonized by their community uh, for different things? I wish I knew the exact answer, but um, I think that it does start with just being positive. And I don't think that's hard. That's something that, that's something that my news director always tells me when I do any interviews, like just keep it positive, always positive. And I wish that that's advice that everyone took to heart. Um, even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was always, he was always smiling. And when he gave advice, when he gave nasiha, it was always in a kind and a gentle way. And I think that gets lost on us because, especially because of social media, it's a platform where alhamdulillah, it rallies us together, but it also does a really great job of dividing us. And a lot of times we let that happen. We forget that our voices are amplified on social media. And each criticism, it, it hurts a lot more coming from people who you're trying to represent or you're, you know, that you think have your back and are, you'd like to think is your global community. So I think just keeping it positive and just knowing that, yes, there are imperfections that everybody has, and remember that on social media, those are also amplified. Um, but know that there are people, probably, if you've noticed it, there are people in his or her life that have also noticed it and are giving them advice already about it. So that's not necessarily your place to do that. Um, and I think that even before my story came out, I was already feeling nervous more about that than anything else. And I... As a Muslim American, you grow up getting used to racism, right? You're prepared for that. You develop thick skin. Especially as a Muslim woman, I can count early, as early as the age of nine encountering racism. 
um, with my mom in the car wearing hijab. So you develop a way to protect yourself from that, to let it just roll off of you and you know what's important. But you're not prepared. I don't think I will ever be prepared for that backlash that comes from your own. So just maybe if people keep that in mind before they hit enter in the comments. Um, and just make dua, that's the best form, right? I mean, I, I always tell people like, Jazakallah for your kind words, and, but your du'as mean the most to me. And that's for whether you want me to improve and you don't agree with something about me, or just that you would like me to keep going. Either way, just make du'a, inshallah. So you said that you're not a sheikha and that, you know, I'm the one that's supposed to be giving advice, but that's probably the best two minutes on social media that I've heard uh, in the convention uh, thus far. Exactly. So because you probably don't hear it enough, um, and you do hear a lot of criticism from the community, just know that we are extremely proud of you and your family. Uh, yeah, we are, thank you so much. Um, you know, <laughs> you inspire in all of us, men and women, that ability, inshallah ta'ala, to power through with our principles in very uncomfortable spaces. Mm -hmm. And with all due respect to our sister in Canada, they've got Justin Trudeau, we have <laughs> Donald Trump. So... It is a feat, alhamdulillah. What you've accomplished is no small thing. And inshallah, you will inspire others to also move forward. So I'm going to ask your parents one more time to stand up, inshallah ta'ala. And um, may Allah bless you. May Allah keep you sincere. May Allah reward your family. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow you to always be guided and guide Amen. through you. May Allah always allow your heart to be rectified and rectify others through you. And may Allah allow you to only grow both individually and inshallah ta'ala for our community as well. Zakamallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The 55th annual ISNA convention. In God we trust.